Um, hi, my name is Amy Degnan. I'm the CEO of Hook42, but also a, a long-term migrator, uh, starting in around 1995 and 96. I migrated lots of really basic websites, but very big, big custom enterprise systems. Um, and I specialize in CMSs. And I'm Ryan Wheel. I have been, I'm now thinking I actually have done, I've been involved with migrations much longer, but I've been migrating Drupal since 2013, and I've been <coughs> around the Drupal community since 2008. Um, I run my own little company called Cafe Interactive. Who are you? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's, I'm sassy today. Um, who's a developer? Okay. Who's a project manager? Okay. Okay. Um, who's a product manager? Oh, a few. Very few, actually. Um, who's an executive? Okay. Who's all of them? <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. Um, yeah, okay, so this is going to be good for developers and project managers, and I hope this is going to resonate um, for both of the folks here. So. Um, we're going to go fast and enjoy the ride. Slides are text heavy, but so is project management and so is migrations. So are migrations. Um, sorry about that. Um, slides will be posted after the session on the session, session deck. And before I forget, at the please rate the session when you're over, when it's over. So. And what we're going to do today to walk through this is we're going to take a sample site, like a sample case. A fictitious site. A fictitious site. That kind of combines some of our different projects from the past, ideas and inspiration, we'll say. Right. <laughs> then we're going to give you background about migrations, and then we're going to talk specifically about migration phases. So who's migrated a site here? OK. Actually, not everybody. Those who have done it, can you in one word describe it? Hard. <laughs> OK, hard. Messy, there was a hell. Hell. hell, okay. <laughs> Hard, messy, hell, long, huh? Tornado. Tornado. <laughs> yeah, crazy storm going on. <laughs> um, yeah, those are all emotional feeling words. Um, and they're very valid. So let's help have process and data and planning kind of help that, help mitigate those angry words. Smooth over the rough parts. <laughs> I got into this because I got really sick of doing copy and paste and having the variables. So this is a way to try to contain the stuff. But as we'll see, <laughs> hang on for the ride. Containing, <laughs> so. Right. So first, let's get a migration project, and that's nexustravel.com. So, so this is our fictitious. I actually own this domain, but nothing is on it. Right <laughs> if you go there, GoDaddy's like, nah. Um, this is the multilingual demo, which Hook42 and the, the D8 Multilingual Initiative put together. Um, this is Nexus Travel. Um, it's a travel site. It's an online business that sells pre-planned trips. It was built on the now non-supported Drupal 6. The website is large. It has many enterprise-grade features. There's lots of content of different types on the website, and much of the custom code interacts with data. And about the content? Uh, we have location data, tours, vendors, members, pictures, tagging, advertisements, commerce stuff, but then there's always, you know, things that people forget, so we'll get to that too, but we've got nodes, so like pages, users um, with additional information. Um, we've got media entities that store our pictures and have metadata, taxonomy, more metadata, blocks that have additional info, advertisements, and then commerce has many levels of entities for payments, orders, line items, payment <laughs> transaction <laughs> IDs, yeah. shipping things. I think there's like 25 or something billing, like migrations info, just for commerce. All sorts of things, so entities. <laughs> And the, the, the client says, hey, we're under a tight timeline. And the new and improved features, we haven't defined those yet. Um, and the large, we've actually committed to our vendors a huge amount of like investment. Like they paid us a lot of money for these features and they have to be out by a certain time. Um, 
And organic SEO is the largest driver of traffic to their site. So that's fun, right? Um, and how do you feel right now? Who feels like this? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I have goosebumps. How are you feeling? That's the air conditioning. Too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or who feels like this? Like a superhero. Mm -hmm. Damn right we can do this. So. Responses to that one. Yeah, yeah, before the video, no one says yes. Um, well, we're going to hopefully, like everybody should kind of feel like irked looking like that when the business says, oh, we haven't defined things and we have a tight timeline and we've committed money to Or this. even better, a multi that's about to hit and we need it just like, just about three minutes before that launches. Yeah, just these, yeah, these things have happened. <laughs> this is real. This is like for many projects, lots of projects we've been on. These are real situations. So, but before we start into like how, let's understand migration projects in general. They're totally easy, right? <laughs> yeah, that'll be simple. Let's leave it to the end. Yeah, no. What could yeah. go wrong? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, let's explore why we migrate. Like. So Drupal 6 is dead, but there's lots of Drupal 6 sites out there. I've even heard of some Drupal 5 sites out there. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> if it keeps going, let's, you know, it's ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Well, but sometimes you get, your company gets purchased and you have to merge into different technologies. And then sometimes you like, sometimes you get a site from a, like a client, a new client, and it's just horrid and like, migrate out of the site that someone else was building because it was so convoluted that it's just easier to rebuild from scratch. And that's not just easier, it's more cost effective to do a migration other than like unraveling the crazy yarn. Um, also, if you need to do like infrastructure or architecture cleanup, um, if you're moving from one kind of major infrastructure change to another. Or like merging multilingual sites into one or yeah. all sorts of different things that people think of with our structure is slightly different now. Right, and sometimes you want to have some massive rebranding that you want to do somewhere else. Um, maybe a lot of new content architecture or new content messaging, but you want to keep your other site up and going at the same time. So. And there's more reasons to migrate, but these are like some of the big ones. And there's lots of types of, there's like four main types of migration. First of all, there's like one-to-one -one migrations, which is like, just keep the data structure and the functionality exactly the same, please. And this is like the Drupal six to eight migration magic mm -hmm. button, right? And that's in core. And there's also in Drupal seven, the Drupal to Drupal migration sort of does. I'm trying to do it. But that seems like it's the most straightforward because you maintain data types and functionality and you're like, yeah, that's apples to apples. But sometimes you have transformation, right? So. Um, you're going to take old data and you're going to switch it into a new architecture. So you might have apples and you get applesauce and then you get apple slices and you get like, like dried apples somewhere else. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's different. Um, or maybe you had like components of an address field that's now going into one field. Right. Multiple yeah. sources to a single source. Yeah, and yeah, often like sometimes somebody will have maybe an internationalization strategy that has like en.foo and fr.foo and then they're going to migrate into foo.com slash en. So that actually is multiple sources into a single source and, or the, 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 the vice versa. It's like you can split it out into those multiple domains. Yeah. Um, and in real life, your project may actually use all types. You may not be dealing with just one. And when you start migrating the content? You can just run it all at once and say, oh, we did it. Done. But then what will happen is there's new blog posts. If you've got commerce in the mix, you've got new orders coming in while you're developing. And then an incremental pass will bring in the new items. Some people will request that you actually roll everything back and then roll it forward again, but you can just pull the new items. So these are strategies that you should be thinking about Right, and in real life, your project based on your content might use both types, right? Um, and the single pass is like, press the button, you migrate it once, it's done, everybody has like champagne, and this incremental is like, I have a ginormous site where you have to trickle it in and I can't press the button once because it just physically takes a long time to migrate. 
Um, so there's many different reasons why you use single pass versus incremental. The most common I've found is a single pass can be very good for the marketing content, like your basic page. Yeah. They want to rework that content, they're going to throw out some of this stuff, but meanwhile there's new blog posts, there's new commerce stuff, and they don't want that stuff that they're editing changed. So that, that's where you start making that split of like, we're going to do these incremental, we're going to do these once, and then you're just going to edit those yourself. Right, sometimes the client will ask, hey, can you please, um, can you please get the structure of those basic pages over, and then we're going to tweak it while you've got, you guys do the rest of the migration. So. And then they do, so it's like content freeze on a subset of content on your site. But also size, scale, and complexity really matters. So if you have a small enough amount of content, why pay to code to migrate it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to count the number of objects, and we'll be repeating this throughout, but if you find that it's like, we've only got 40 items, you know, maybe it makes sense to, you know, get your friend to, you know, has some spare time to just do some copy and paste for you versus like coding a lot of stuff if it, you know, so things to consider is that don't always need to code everything, but coding everything is nice in that it's ready when you're there to migrate because you could put something on hold, come back to it, and then go, oh, we just pressed the button again, so. Right, and also if you don't have enough skilled developers doing a lot everything, you can have put together your migration party. So order pizza, have everybody get together, everybody has 100 things or 50 things or whatever, and they're bringing those over. There's issues with that sometimes, but if you have budget constraints and you have a lot of hands that are, are within budget already, then use them as necessary. And, and really pick your battles. Like, choose, if, if there's gonna be development for various components, and you know that this is critical to the business, get that done because that's critical. So yeah. it's important to think about that and not spend your migration time on the little details that aren't business critical. Yeah, and what you will, and we'll talk a little bit about architecture later, but when, when you go like, oh, I have this whole site and everything was in the body field and we have all these content blobs, I really want to use paragraphs in the future or some type of structured field. Um, you really want to consider the amount of time that takes to actually do something like that, and it's very complex. So, so if we look at this small amount of content as manual, um, programmatic, you have large amounts of content that has lots of interrelationships. And then also sometimes you might, like what we've done is we've set up the structure and the big blob of body for everything. We've migrated that over in a structured content area, like, or in a structured content type, but we just kept the body field filled with content so we could display the old while the migrators like, will manually move that over because it needs humans. So you get the best of both worlds. Here, I'll give you all this stuff over here programmatically, get you jump started, and all your team needs to do is jump in and reference that information and put it around. So it's, it's, it's kind of nifty. Rather than populating the new fields, you simply leave those for new content and bring stuff into the equivalent right. the body field and just say that's it. So yeah, that can be really nice because they don't have to rework every piece of content or validate as much stuff. In and they testing. can start new with a new content architecture. Uh, in real life, how many files do you have? <laughs> this is real. <laughs> and there's so much content. So um, yeah, this is real. Who has, like, who has a photo heavy site? There's a lot of them. You guys know what this feels like? Yeah. Okay. Um, you also can cover multiple technologies. So um, Drupal to Drupal, right? Thanks community, there's a lot of tools there. It's right? fairly automatic, it's got rough edges and it's getting better, so there's okay. that. <laughs> but you can assume that there's custom development that has to happen on every migration, that every complex-ish migration. Um, and there's flat websites to Drupal, or custom DBs to Drupal, and other CMSs to Drupal. We've had to do a hybrid of this where Joomla content doesn't really get built until the later stages, so you can't just query from the database and get your HTML. So you end up building a screen scraper that's pretty much a flat file migration, and it's a different approach, but you get it done. So. Yeah, in the the wild for this, there's a lot of different tools that you can use for site scraping or data transformation and that type of thing, but, but you have to actually do work. Um, but the nice thing about Drupal 8's migration kind of platform, it does give you a nice interface to start dealing with those multiple sources. And your project may use many types. 
right? If you're coming in from a Joomla marketing site and you have a WordPress blog and then you have a couple of other like custom database storage for your, your product database, there's got a lot of stuff coming on if you're bringing it all into Drupal. Um, also, if there's some infrastructure considerations, infrastructure is a huge deal in migrations. Because um, like on Pantheon and Pantheon, you can't move files or rename files. Um, so pull them all down and push them all back up. To yeah, or instances. copy them <laughs> over to another area. Um, but that's okay. It's because they have, it's, it's because their infrastructure has a super smart file system. Um, Acquia, their files directory structure is often kind of crazy looking. Um, and you have to be very deliberate that you don't migrate to or copy from the wrong place. Um, also, like if you're working on a local host, you might run into like memory limitations either on the local host or the remote host. Mm -hmm. Also, you don't have debugging tools remotely. Like, there's a lot of things. And if you don't have the files locally, you can defer to the HTTP URL, which means you're hammering the firewall, downloading yeah. thousands of files from your local machine. So it's something to be mindful of. Right. And network is a big deal. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's not just your transfer speed up. It's down if you're doing it from host to host in the cloud. It's the, the speeds between those, what's capped. And time is important in migrations. This is a big deal. But also, can, do you have access to get to this port from where you are? So. And this is legitimate impacts to your planning, because trying to get access takes a long time. Trying mm -hmm. to fix the access, trying to do this. And like, if you can really be, uh, mitigate those like, horrible delays on projects just because somebody can't get through a damn port. Um, so we talked a little bit about the pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Projects take longer than expected. You Migrations run into after hours. <laughs> Sometimes people want to launch on the weekend, which is a little <laughs> crazy, I think. Yeah. And work is really detail oriented. If you yeah. do not have a detailed person on your team, highly consider not having them on your migration project. And you need focus time. If, like, as a client, you're going, hey, let's have another meeting, let's have another meeting, let's have another meeting, well, you just killed a day. Yeah. So that can be very problematic as well. So it's important to time box your development time and know that you have a focus. Also, super careful, deliberate note taking is required, and we'll get into why in a bit. And the work can be intense, right? <laughs> and who likes to work like this? <laughs> Everybody's shaking their head for the video. Seriously, and, and as project managers, and actually as developers on a project management, on a uh, migration team, developers want to be understood that they don't want to be like worked like that. Project managers also are kind of stuck in the middle, but you guys have to mitigate the health of your team for longevity and project fitness. So. Yeah, you really have to watch when it's like, well, let's just do a 12 hour day because then there's another thing that comes into play and then you're running on empty, you don't have a recharge. So you need to you know, respect that people have time limits. And for those that are familiar with Agile, like um, I think it's, it's if you have people work overtime for a total of like one sprint's fine and then like the production, like if you have a two week sprint, if you do it for one sprint, it's like fine, but then it like the diminishing, like it's like diminishing, <laughs> diminishing returns, returns yeah. is like, <laughs> like and everybody checks out, it's like give them a, and it, it takes longer to get re recover from that for your team. Um, also, you would need very specialized people on your team if you want your project to be a success. So um, a migration project manager, it is very hard to project manage a migration project well. Because there's a lot of um, kitten wrangling and things. New requirements, forgotten requirements. Everything. <laughs> you know, somebody gets sick, something yeah. like that happens. Everyone wants it yesterday, so. Yeah, and they're to plan and kind of wrangle and educate. Um, so you also actually need the source technology. So if you're coming from like cold fusion or some other thing, you need someone that actually knows that a little bit so you can get access to it, get maybe like undercover of the, you know, go into the belly of the data so you can get to it. I was once asked, how did you get all of that stuff into the site when someone else took over? And I said, well, I knew it was an MS SQL site and I knew MS SQL had XML support, so I taught myself to write MS SQL queries so I could get XML 
and then I migrated from XML. And they were like, whoa, and I said, yeah, that's how it felt. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do. So. <laughs> um, the migration engineer at that point is being creative and developing <laughs> migration yeah. code. Um, the migrator, there's this button, a lot of, not a lot of people think about this, but there's the push, per, push in, the, the person pushing the button. <laughs> more coffee, more coffee. So you got everything ready, but somebody has to go through your script of activities. And you can code a lot of things, but you're still going to have to make sure that all of the pieces fit together at the end. So there are going to be manual steps, and that's the person that's doing those steps. Right, and that person is not a button pusher. Like They actually are the person that's responsible to recover the whole site from failure. So if you're pushing the button, you're fixing that if it breaks. And that, you have a big ginormous site, and you're on certain infrastructures, and you have gigamets of files, you, it, that's harder to do, so. Um, and then also you need a data specialist to test the migrated data. Not just like, oh, it looks good on the page, but to like, cor correct is the data. It's the worst feeling when someone says like, just before launch, oh, whatever happened to this field? It's like you really need to review every single detail. And like I've seen people print out pages and mark X's over every field to verify yep. that they like know that they looked at it, because sometimes it's easy to forget. Right. And like where do you get these people? <laughs> you, call, you call us. Um, <laughs> you actually like uh, I talk to people who, who have done migrations before, so. Um, there's a lot, we're not going to go into details, but as project managers, it's, you have to like, address the personas of people on your team and what they're looking for from you for communication plans. So business owners want to know like, when their site's going to be done and how much money am I paying. Account managers are like, oh, is everything okay with the, the business? You know, and project managers are like, oh my god, are we going to get this done? Migration engineers is like, don't bother me, I'm building this. <laughs> and that, well, actually, the, I'm, I'm coding a migration. And then the developers are like, don't bother me, I'm building the site. And the site builders are like, hey, can I make my content type yet? I just want to change this one thing. I just want to change this one thing. And the themers are like, why can I not make CSS kind of tweaks on my like, view modes and things yet? Yeah, different tracks. <laughs> yeah, every, and, and they have different considerations within the course of the project. So. But the takeaway here is thorough planning and vigilant, not vigilante management <laughs> <laughs> leads to project success and let the numbers prove it. So we're gonna do some math along the way with our sample website. And really in the end, make it easier on your team and simplify when you can. Oh. Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. No cell left behind. One student per row. Um, no, really, really spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're this is meant data. to address some of the, the, the variety of people working on the project. Uh, you'll have people that may not be familiar with a bug tracker, um, or you know, you'll have your lead on the project, but then they will have other content specialists working on stuff. You just want to get that data, and spreadsheets Pro start to realize there's more vectors you want to be tracking. You can just expand that out really quickly. You're not being constantly bludgeoned by the tools, like I have to t spend 10 minutes per issue, you can just like paste a few things in yeah. and come back to it if you need to. Yeah, and Google, Google Sheets is great, you can share it and it, you can actually track who's d touched anything. So, wow, yeah, project managers, you're like, who touched that? Why did you change it? <laughs> that was requirements freeze. So um, things we end up adding is like a notes column for the developer and then a notes column for the client. And then sometimes you'll want other teams to also have some input. And that's where cases you just say, well, we did this, but we found this problem. And then when you're going through your meeting, you have a bit of info, but then you can elaborate and you know that point needs to be dealt with. And I kind of feel like this right now. I feel like we're this person going, see this stack of papers? <laughs> That's hard. This is easy. But we're talking about, oops. Come on, there it is. My, like the on click isn't clicking. Um, we're talking about migrations or this stack, right? This is the stack of, of data we're talking about for migrations to track it and manage it. So you can't, you can't not do this because then it'll lead to time wasted, high costs and, and uh, oops. And the devil's in the details. <laughs> it's, it's true. So. 
So now we're going to start to get started. <laughs> so that was just thinking about migrating. Now we're going to start actually planning migrating. But how do you use, what planning techniques do you use? Um, and there's benefits to waterfall and agile. Don't make it be a battle. Um, absolutely for migrations, waterfall is a perfect thing for order of operations. This must go before this because that is dependent on that. That's beautiful. But also the biggest beautiful piece is the sign-off piece. You have to have your clients sign off so you can be like, thank you, things change, right? Because this is true on my, we'll show it in a second. But agile actually is great because the meeting cadence and the review and acceptance of things is very frequent. I've encountered a lot of cases where people are like, okay, we'll just get the migration done and then hooray, it's done. And it's like the first meeting after you start talking about migration is not when it's done. It, that's the first time you review the odd things in the content because you're going to find weird things and then you're going to iterate and then you're going to review it again with them and you're going to need to review multiple times because this is their baby. They have like their business infrastructure based on this and if they assume that it's going to be perfect the first time, it's not. And sometimes that just means they want to re-architect or they realize that there was something they didn't like about the old site, but these are the things that start coming up. And our, our client, he, it's a Drupal 6 site. Maybe they just did that at Drupal 6.1, remember that, Kristen? <laughs> in 2008? That's a nine-year-old site. And do you think data would have corruption over time, maybe, due to changes? Yeah. A lot of stuff in the older versions of Drupal, and any other system for that matter, we're not as good as we are now at input validation. So that stuff may have been brought through multiple generations of the project, and now you're going to find, well, hey, three years ago, your products are starting to fail. Did you have a different product type that's, oh yeah, we deleted that. And, and then you're like worried about it, but if you don't have that meeting with them, you're gonna go and fix all of that and spend hours fixing it, and then you show up with a client, and they go, yeah, I don't need that. And you're like, oh! So your spreadsheets are coming in handy because you're having spreadsheets to map out your fields and yeah. get sign off that this is what you want. Yeah. And they forget all the details of how big it actually is in the site because they're just happily using it and not thinking about the architecture on a day-to-day -day basis. Cool. So we've gotten through two big chunks of the, uh, of the presentation. Now we're going to move into the phases of a migration project. There are ten. Um, you can add sub-phases or whatever, but these are just very broad <coughs> concepts. But we're going to group them into three segments. Getting started with your project, building the site and migration, then actually the total production migration. So three phases are in getting started, another, uh, the four phases are in building, and then the rest are in production migration. You guys ready to get started? <laughs> because that's the that next I just <laughs> didn't find that. <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about pre-project education, audit for migration, and discovery. So setting the expectation of, you know, we are going to need to review. It's very important. Um, building out spreadsheets. Well, on this, this is the key one, especially if you have a paying client that has never gone through a migration. You have to let them know what the phases are and what they're going to experience and what's <laughs> asked of them. And you want to make sure that you clarify impact of requirements series and when it, if it's not frozen, the impact to budget and, and time. And then this is early in the account management. You want to identify if it's a really big site. Do you want to do phased <laughs> statements of work? Um, maybe for the getting started, like discovery and, and architecture phase. Um, maybe that's one type of sta statement of work, and then you can do another statement of work otherwise, because as we talk through migrations, you'll see how the, the cost and time is quite unknown until you get more details along the way. This can even be hard to do if you've been the manager of the site over the past generations that you, you yourself forget, like, oh yeah, we built that crazy thing and I forgot about it. So <laughs> you do still need to go through this process even if you have been the maintainer of the site for a decade. And no client wants to hear it's ready when it's ready, but that's kind of what migrations are um, due to all of the different variables that change over time. But we don't want them to change. We want to have very clear things so we can build it, right? 
Um, but the education projects take time, specialization, requirements, lockdown, project fitness, because they're long. Um, and transparency, like, hey, this took longer. Oh, cool, this took shorter. Hey, please don't make that feature. Please don't or migrate that content. We're stuck on this thing, and we can't proceed until that's done. Yeah, know, that o open communication, yeah. And then for our sampled site for Nexus Travel, after we've gone through that phase, um, we did let them know that their non-defined features are a huge risk. We said that the time constraints will impact the developer work-life balance, because um, nights and weekends have to be done, and they need to mitigate the customer expectations, their customer expectations, with new feature dates and launches. Uh, but, okay, so, yeah, thanks, client knows, let's get something started, right? Mm -hmm. Then you start digging into the site, you're looking around, you're doing your kind of discovery, as you would if you were looking at the site for the first time, going through, quantifying things, looking at the content types, looking at the entity types, all sorts of stuff like this. Right. Figuring out what stuff you may have forgotten about, what stuff that they have forgotten about, yeah. functionality that has, you find this section of the site that has a bunch of custom code and stuff associated with that, custom database tables. And something that's interesting here is like customers will have like eight different words for some feature that have evolved over the last nine years since the D6 one launch. Um, so that type of, that you can see that spar sparkled through like code and configurations and notes and data. Um, so basically you'll get all the AKAs because everybody will call things differently. Um, and at this point, the audit for migration, we have a risk register, a huge content audit, audit spreadsheet with a structure, data, size, and source of, of information. We have a functionality audit. Um, and then this is where it surfaces custom code that they might not have told you. <laughs> Um, we have a data help on it, so it's talking about surfing, like, oh, years ago, this product, what happened? So you do this early, so you don't get there later and spend that time developing against it. Also look at the existing infrastructure, like, can, do we have to do this in place? Do we bring the source content down? And you also do SEO, accessibility, like permissions and access controls. And um, you get all the source URLs. Right? Because you have to start planning like, oh, if I'm going to migrate, I need to do redirects for good SEO. But what's really cool out of this step is links to representative content on the source site. So if you have a product page, but you have 12 variants of product, you want 12 variant links that represent each type of product because each one might have different display rules and different data fields that are shown and everything. So this is the, this, that little list is like money through the whole project. You'll, you'll use it through every single phase. You'll want like the most complex of the things that are built in the site. So if you have like a product that has all these options and some of the products don't have those options, you want the one with all the options because you need to validate. And this will be great when you're going through your meetings with the client saying, okay, We've got all of the fields. You can see they're all populated. It's easy to just like migrate and look at the first item and go, oh, yeah, the stuff is there. I see stuff. And if the developer <laughs> has that while they're developing, they're like, why didn't that thing come over? Oh, oh, it's because that bit of silent error. Oh, yeah, cool. So um, getting that up front is great. The olden days, they call them use cases. <laughs> but for everybody on the team, it's like, oh, did that page work? And it's like, totally get, everybody gets it. Did the page look right? Um, and that is a really tangible thing. Oh, 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 I almost forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if your DNS is set to cache for like seven days or something ridiculous, which has actually happened to us. And yeah. then you we go, well, we made the change, but it's yeah. going to take a while. So you can start <laughs> thinking about that early on and then you can readjust things beforehand so that when you actually get to launch, you, you can be on forget. a quicker refresh, <laughs> things like that. And sometimes you have to ask like three IT guys deep to change the DNS because somebody owns that access that's not you or the marketing team. So. Um, lessons learned here. <laughs> Very few developers know how to audit for migration and it takes way longer than you expect 
to get the detail that you need, even using tools to help you. Especially if it's the first time you're doing this, it's mm -hmm. going to be longer to get your head around some of the concepts. Yeah. And auditing twice is costly, especially after you've done a lot of work and then you have to go back to audit. Um, also, this comes no cell left behind. If you're doing an audit and there's a blank cell, it means that nobody thought about it yet. But if there's NA, that means it's, no, not it's applicable. Like yeah. <laughs> I have looked at this cell and I have made the decision that this is not necessary. Empty means I haven't done it yet. So, um, and also keep everything in one place. Make one Google Drive folder have a, just a few spreadsheets because if you have a ginormous amounts of spreadsheets, you cannot like relate information back and forth in the spreadsheet. You can't, people get lost and through the life cycle of projects, they're like, oh, I just have the link. Do you have the link? And that's how we talk about it in meetings. Hey, what's the link? And that the link is the migration mapping spreadsheet <coughs> or the link is the go live checklist with all of the things It avoids that like information overload paralysis where you're like, oh, I have this issue. And then you're like, do I put it there? Do I put it there? Do I put it there? Do I have to put it in three places? Like just put it in one place, put everything in one place. So yeah. it's easy to get your head around. And then also it mitigates like developers and architects or anybody really toward the end going, oh, I didn't think about that. Right, because it really gets you into everything that's happened and it starts making you think about content and the ethereal thing. So actually, out of our project, we have all of these um, content types or nodes and blocks. This is the count that we have and the complexity. So we have like a lot. We have 50,000 members. We have like... So we're trying to quantify like the number of items. So we have an idea of like importance, how long it's going to take to run. But we're also quantifying the number of migrations that we're going to be running. So we're looking, in this case, sort of at entity types, users and entity, file and media are entity, taxonomies and entity. But as we get down to the end of the list, we're seeing like O-commerce entities. There's many of those actually. Those are gonna break out into like five or six different types maybe, or even a seven or eight, if depending on how complex the store is. And naturally, I just, when we were putting this together, it's like we don't, we just absolutely make it in the migration order, in a dependency order of content. So normally you do user roles first, and users, then taxonomies or files, vice versa. Um, and then you start doing the content types, and you can do the most simple one, like basic page. And you add some of complexity that feed into other content types, entity relationships. So it's like building a house. Um, so we just naturally did it. But basically, a huge thing, we'll talk about this later, is that you have to put the migrations and the content in a dependency order. You must have a user, a role vendor, to be related to the vendor node for access to update it. Right? So, so you can totally import the nodes, but if you haven't imported the users, everyone's going, all the nodes are owned by Anonymous. So that's not that useful to you. You want to make sure that everything you need on that, that to hook into on that page is there. Migrate will stub, stub out some of the things in certain cases, but it's just easier to run it, you know, in the order of things that need to be there. So. All of that stuff comes before commerce because commerce needs to know Everything. that there is a you know, product. It needs to know that a user bought this and needs to know who that user was so it can put the... Yeah, and then of course at the end you have aliases and redirects. Everything has to be in to make sure the last of the aliases and all the redirects happen. And so we just average like, oh, for all entities that are public to, you know, or all entities that have a, um, an alias or a path auto, there's one or two um, there's two redirects and at least one active alias, so that's where those numbers came from. That's not huge, right? Are you guys, who's scared? Who's the scared person here? Um, no, that's okay, we can do this. So then you go into your classic discovery phase, right? And this is where we're going to do new functionality, take them through requirements, gathering, um, prioritize the feature development, like what's really important. Um, with the data in mind. Um, and then it, this is where you capture expectations on the data migration. Oh, make sure that the unpublished blog posts get carried over, because we like to look at it. Mm -hmm. right? um, and also, it's a big thing, is we have to re-educate the business with findings here. It can also be good at this stage to ask for pain points. Like, what do you not like about your site? 
you know, what things do you want to re-architect? Because that will open up the opportunity to change those things. And you'll find in some cases that like in Drupal 6, they did it this way because that was easy to do with Drupal 6, but maybe that's not actually what they wanted or needed. Like, so it can be much easier if you find out, well, this is kind of difficult for us, and they say, well, that's actually really easy to do in Drupal 8. We can throw all that out, so yeah. awesome. You know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and then a lot of the artifacts that come out of here is like a feature list, a feature roadmap as well, right? Now, when I say feature, it's like a higher level one. This is what cl the client will actually talk about. Oh, is the, is the, the landing page done? Right. Or the, is the shopping cart ready? Yeah, <laughs> right. So this is like here, but yet you're in the your team's in the details. So you might have many steps that mean is the shopping cart ready. This is where you get the feature requirements. You also uh, continue ex like expanding your project glossary um, because we had a, a a project that's like travel agent work with the travel agent to create the tour. And those travel agents meant three different things. It's like I have a feature on my website that uses features feature, right? And it's like using features module. It's, it's the same type of thing. So you really want to elaborate with the also known as clarify product glossary or project glossaries and go from there. And you elaborate on the representative links list. It's like, oh yeah, you found more things now that we're talking about that we didn't find before. And then when we were talking with Nexus Travel. <laughs> <laughs> what data did we keep? Um, oh, the transformation of things is Fantastic. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so our client, they want to like take old Drupal 6 select lists and make them into taxonomy terms. Um, so this happens a lot before because the taxonomy is huge and strong in Drupal 8. So. Mm -hmm. um, this is again just re-architecture, but it's not trivial, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, functionality is not the same. It's so <laughs> if you hear a client say, oh yeah, don't worry about it, most of the functionality is going to be exactly the same, don't ever trust them, ever. <laughs> We've heard it on every project that has a migration, and it's not true. Because they'll be like, well, this, the pain points start coming up, yeah, actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So if you don't ask, you're like, late, later you'll get the pain point. Well, why did you do it like that? Well, you said do it exactly the same way. I mean, you'll, of course, re-architect a little bit be with new technology, but you're like, wait, no, no, you said the same thing. It's like, if you're moving away from Drupal 6, don't rebuild Drupal 6. Yeah. It doesn't make yeah. sense. <laughs> it's like going backwards and forwards at the same time. Yeah, so we haven't even started building stuff, but now we are. Um, so we're going to architect the site, map migrations, informations. We're going to actually build it. And then we're doing this thing called pre-production migration. We're going to zip through these. So um, in architecture, you're going to define the content structure and then define the infrastructure. And we're not going to talk about this in the session because that's why we're at DrupalCon to learn how to architect the new site. <laughs> you're going to take all your spreadsheets from the audit and you're going to expand on them, right? And then this is where we know a little bit more about which order the features should be developed and mm -hmm. what's in scope and possibly out of scope. Yeah, pushing stuff forward into the roadmap. If you're like new functionality, it might be better that we put that into phase two that we launch and then we bring in new stuff after so that it's ready. This will help constrain the timeline. Um, yeah, and um, what's the one thing we do a lot is site architecture spreadsheet. So um, when we look at the audit, we capture things like the source field name, the data type, um, any kind of notes or values that it may be. And now the site architecture spreadsheet, you know, that, that audit was the as is, this is the to be. So this is where we define, hey, our new architecture, we look at the other one and we're like, oh yeah, we want it to look like this. But it's not the migration maps, mapping spreadsheet. It's like old stuff, new stuff, and then later you have a spreadsheet that calls mapping stuff, right? So there are three separate things. Are you looking at old stuff, new stuff, or the mapping? Because they get quite big, right? And then also doing URL pattern planning. So I can't say that 10 times <laughs> All right, so um, back to the quantification. So entities are each generally a migration. You'll run into cases like with paragraphs where you have like five variants and 
you can go and try to code all your migrations to do each variant, but you sometimes end up shooting yourself in the foot and you'll often find it's just easier to do five migrations for each variant. So even though that sounds like it's more work, like file save as and just doing that with all the same fields, but then augmenting that little structural difference can be simpler than joins. <laughs> yeah, Daryl's laughing. We, we have a, the thing next for you. you. You'll see it, yeah. So um, media entities require at least two passes. And the first one's interesting. You have to copy all the files up, and then you have to run the files, basically files managed. You have to tell Drupal files exist, and then you have to import them as a media entity. Yeah. So that's a big and deal. To our earlier point about validating the data to see if there's any corruption, one to two percent of the files will just be gone. Bit rot. Mm -hmm. Bit rot is real. Yep. I never really believed this until I've done it like ten times over with different sites over the years, and I was like, oh yeah, there's always going to be one or two percent of the files that are just gone. Yeah, it's Who knows crazy. why? Could be the operating system, could be the disk, could be any number of things, but that's going to be a thing. Thieves. Um, it could be that the client deleted it and they didn't delete references. You know, true. they yeah. went behind the scenes and deleted it outside of the interface. Yeah, and I really want to say that you must architect everything before you start building. Um, and do not ever, 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 ever let your site builders just start building things without writing it down. Fire them if they do. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, that's such a costly thing if they, and, and what sometimes when, yeah, we're, yeah, it, anyway, this happened before and it's not like our people, it's just we've seen it happen on other projects. You're like, well, where did you lose that data? Where did you use the, lose the decision point? How do you know what's happening now with this? Because there's all this other information that goes with it. And they're like, oh yeah, I just made this thing over here. And it's like, well not required and we needed that first and now we can't migrate yet. Yeah, like but we no, you <laughs> had the architect said you had to do it in this field format because the migration has a certain data type. You can't use that format or the formatter. You can't use that plugin. You can't use that field because the data types need to match. So and now on um, our travel site architects and you know the commerce is doing special and new things. And, um, <laughs> and then they want new things because we've been talking about stuff and they're all like, oh, this old stuff is boring. I saw this shiny new thing, so now I want it. And I forgot to mention it in our past 12 meetings getting set up, but here oh, the we CIO are. CIO is like, sorry, the CEO is happy that we're doing this project and we're like, yeah, we can finally do this thing that we've had on our list for a year because you're here. While you're talking to the developers, could you just get them to do this thing? Yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> like A-B, oh, it's only a little bit of A-B testing, it should be easy, right? Yeah, sure. And the conversion <laughs> funnel, oh, come on, the analytics for conversion It's just clicky-clicky stuff. It's yeah, really just simple. put a JavaScript thing in there, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I hear nervous laughter. <laughs> That's on purpose. So migration mapping spreadsheets are going to be like each of your content types. Uh, we do. Uh, one spreadsheet with multiple tabs, and then one tab will be each con each entity, entity type, type, and we list out each field. So on the left side, you've got your old, and on your right side, you've got your new, and you have the client go through and validate each of these things, because that's where you find out that this really <coughs> convoluted field is just going to go away. Yeah, and, and that saves you a lot of time down the road. And because migration engineers are going to be like, you're going to be like, hey, start migrating the site, and they're like, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and then it's all quiet. Um, so this migration mapping spreadsheet is their, their technical requirements for doing their development. So. And it also creates a great testing matrix for the post-migration data audit. So the big people that actually use this um, are the migration engineers and the data testers. This can be a good place to put the representative nodes as well. Yeah, like you reference out back to the representative node. The migration person can then just be focused on the spreadsheets, they're like mapping out the fields, they run it, and they go, oh, I want to see node 1496. They go right to that, they see it's there, they move on. You've just made their job way more efficient. Right, and actually what's really, so don't have entities for your like migrations. A lot of times they'll just run, you'll run the whole migration and see just what happens. 
and you, you maybe like a representative node is like really deep, you know, in, in your migration. But if you have representative nodes, they can like migrate those exactly so the migration development time is drastically reduced. It's like, oh, I can just run 10, mm -hmm. make sure everything's okay, and be like, all right, I think I got everything. Now I'm gonna run a full pass to see like this, like how does this work on all the data, not just these few representative nodes. You'll find many sites where they built out the initial content using a set of base fields, and then later on they were like, well, let's add something to it, and that won't come until a thousand nodes later. Yeah. And um, also the artifacts here, we talked about that middle like map migration mapping spreadsheet. You also look at all of the other spreadsheets. Like, oh, cool, the source field list is already on your audit. Oh, cool, I'm just gonna cut and paste those over. Oh, cool, the destination already is on the, the architecture sheet. And you're like, why are you copying those things over? Um, but it actually lets another engineer look at the data to see if it's right, right? So it's like one more eyes and validation that our architecture didn't shoot ourselves in the foot for migration. So it's like, let's review that, and then they start going. What's also a huge thing that happens is the client will be required to clean up select lists. Like if they use select lists before and they want to go to a taxonomy term system, they'll, you'll have a list of like old strings to new term IDs, right? And that may be different for different types of content. So yeah, you can do things like this TI or this this string will match to this taxonomy term, or or this string will match to this TID, which represents a taxonomy term. And you yeah. can take different approaches with that. Some may be faster than others, depending on what you're trying to do. Right. And what's interesting is we talk a little bit about migration dependencies. You have to do roles <coughs> first, then you do users. So at this point, you're working with the migration engineer to surface any of the subtleties of like what really needs to go first based on all the different entity types. So. Um, and some lessons learned. Um, <laughs> you can do it at the same time as you're doing your new architecture and you probably should, right? Like I'm architecting based on what I need to migrate over and what I need to fulfill for functionality. You do that at the same time. So it's not like here, person, oh. here's a migration mapping task. You just do it at the same time. Um, so we've got Types, field lengths, formats, dates, filters, all of these things have their own challenges. Um, so you have to write them down? <laughs> Seriously? Dates, yeah. you're going to find things like formats are different. You may have to augment those. Um, this stuff you often don't find until later in the process, like latitude, longitude fields are a good example. Like you have to look at the new format. And what I'll do in those cases is create a node in the new site and look, use the develop tab and see what the structure that came out as, and then just try to re-implement that structure. Yeah, and one thing that's been interesting is like, the field length got us on certain text fields because like, somebody went in and site built really quickly without looking at the old source, and they're like, no, I want that new field to be displayed smaller. What do you do? You just crop everything? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they, they say, I want, it, I want it displayed smaller, so I'm just going to choose the allowed character length to 60 instead of 150. And what that happened on the migration is, well, it just chopped everything at like 60. They, can't, they didn't even make a new field and say, can you just keep the old one and like do something with it, or transform it, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's no like summary at like 300 characters thing. So that happens, right? And also, this is when you're splitting the blobs. Um, it does take a lot of time to go into a structured content from an, like, a known, unknown m bunch of like random HTML. So. OK, migration yeah. mapping, the basic page tag, select list as a text string. The image field is mapped to a specific media type. Hey, let's add Spanish. So at this like, wait, time, what, wait, we just wait, added that language? Wait, <laughs> we're on phase five, and we yeah. already architected the site. Oh, that's going to add some time and effort. So at least it's at least it's in the architecture phase, right? We haven't built anything. So now we're building anything. We have to re-estimate the work based on knowledge we have. And we have to go back to the site architecture if necessary <laughs> because we added Spanish. And then we have to re-educate the client because this phase of development is like the hunker down phase. So they might be like, why aren't you talking to us as much anymore? 
Because we're hunkering down. This is where you tell them about their own data. Like, yeah. what was that thing three years ago? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and at this point, we're building the site. Yeah, just building, but then, <laughs> you know, we keep going and... Well, actually, the biggest thing is we start the go live checklist, so we start cap like this is where we're like starting all of the migration lists that we're doing so and and how we roll back the site so very early um, and this is once again the site building must be finished um, at least or that for a specific feature finished and then you can move that on and develop um, parallel so within our migration mapping spreadsheet we might mark one as ready so we make that tab green so that means go ahead migrator one might be red because we still need the client to approve the fields Right, and then we're gonna do the migration dependencies, develop the code, and the developer is responsible for the first population of how long it takes for a migration pass. Like if, when you do it full bore, it, how long does it take for 50 to, you know, 50,000 users to happen? We're gonna get through the other ones, they're a little bit briefer, so. Um, but the big thing is don't over engineer and don't let your team over engineer because you're only doing this once Yes, if you're doing incrementals, you're doing migrations more than once, but it's kind of like, kind of like that. That should just be pulling the new yeah. items. It shouldn't be going back and redeveloping it again, but. Yeah, you are not making a work of art. You're <laughs> uh, here, Daryl, this one's for you. The max <laughs> joins on MySQL database is 61, because those field, those content types with over 150 fields that are split out and together ha happen. Um. <laughs> yeah, don't be fancy, like, this is one database table, I have one database table, keep it flat, don't, don't try to overcomplicate it. Um, right. It will run faster if it's really simple. So. Yeah, documentation of lo along the way is your friend. Um, comments and, like, user-generated migrations need the parent entity to exist. Um, make sure you watch the published and unpublished status of the source when you're developing. Sometimes things will get really slow, and this is a typical indication of a memory leak. So there's ways around that by batching things and running them as like units of 100, but it can also be easier to swap out whatever you're using that's causing that memory leak. So. Yeah, and I bring this up again, splitting a body field to structured field, good luck. Yeah, everyone likes DOM path parsing, right? Yeah. It's great, not really. <laughs> and at this point, um, it, for um, our Nexus travel, we hit the 61 join limit. The share my trip migration ran out of memory and had to be batched in groups of 1,000. The network latency between one of the developer's homes is really high and <laughs> bandwidth is low and can skew migration runtime, especially for file copies. That's Daryl at the end. <laughs> <laughs> this is our story. This can be a case where if you're really familiar with working on servers, maybe you want to have a little server that you set up to do the migration so you can just SSH in and have it like... <laughs> on the backbone somewhere. <laughs> anyway, so now we look at our um, data and we have some migration time here. So it takes, the big juicy one is that trips can take 60 minutes to 120 minutes. And so we're gonna look at that one and, um, and a couple of these, the members take about 90 minutes. So this is important when you're communicating back to the client, like it's gonna take four hours to run the migration. So do we wanna put the site down for four hours while we do the transition, the cutover? Um, this prepares you for that conversation. Right, we also track incrementals, but the grid was too big on the, the, the document. But like, um, it will work, Are, is everybody okay on time? Okay, we're, we're finishing <laughs> up. <minutes>. Okay, <laughs> then you have to do some pre-production migrations, and you just keep running the migrations to see if things are working, if there's no regressions that happen. This is when the client tests the data. Mm -hmm. And then of course they're gonna do something else like, Wait, what was that? You have to populate the bulk of the data, really, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and we talked a little bit about, you estimate the duration of the final go-live migration. <coughs> um, yeah, and at this point, the client says, can you, we, we missed something, can you add it to the migration? So this, this is kind of the, um, the most salient point, is that people are going to hit this point where they go, oh, we forgot, we just completely forgot about this, we're pretty much done, we gotta go back, and that's where the costs start to add up. So you want to try to contain that. This is why we quantify things, so we know it's not in scope. We know that we have to go over our budget. We're really close on budget of time here, but mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But if we do the math, um, so they asked for the trips, and the trips had a two-hour migration. So per migration, 
They're like, oh, I have to do two hours of redefinition to, with the business, because it's a couple meetings. I have eight hours of development, perhaps. There's a, two hours, basically, and four rounds of migrations for the developer to run migrations, the client um, testing to run migrations, the migrator to run a migration, maybe to the production site or the pre-production site, and then the data site QA. So we've got like eight hours of testing and deployments and two hours of deployment overhead. At that point, there's total 20 hours. You're like, yeah, that's cool, that's a day. No, it's not. That's a week because it takes like meetings and then building and then test, 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 test. It's a week and it's about two to $4,000 addition. So that, oops, I forgot, cost money and time and now they're looking at you like, why are you giving me an invoice that's bigger? I'm gonna fix this. Oh, anyway, as you develop, <laughs> I'm gonna make it look prettier. I really forgot to search for those fix me. Um, you wanna do your site architecture, then you right behind it at the same time, you're doing migration mapping. And you can start the infrastructure early too, because you have enough infrastructure stuff to find. So get your hosting set up. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna do that initial site building. Some of those features are defined and the mappings are solid. Let's get that started. Um, then that gives some, something that for the developers to start developing on the migration passes. Then, like the themers are like, why can't I see this without real content? They will then have some real content <laughs> to look at. And at that point, when it kind of all comes together, the client can be really into testing and bug fixes and incremental passes. So that's kind of what it looks like. It takes a little it, downtime or quiet time before the client can really actually touch the site and play along with it. So. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to do this one really quick. So the production migration phase is really the, the you know, where the rubber hits the road. So we're pretty much like quote unquote done and we've yeah. got one minute for our talk. But we're going to go through this one last time and just run the migration. And the client's going to come to us and say, oh, we forgot one more thing. And then we go, okay, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. can we go live or not? Or are we going to do that thing again where we go and calculate out all the new things and figure out what our budget is? And there's a point at the, around this phase where you're like, oh, that, that, that new live server becomes really production. And so you have to treat it as production gold. You can't just chuck migrations again going like, oh, no, that didn't work. And now it's a big mess because you've invested all this time and data. So it's real. Remove all those fix me pages. I know. <laughs> yeah, like, um, okay, and then they ask you to do more stuff, and you're like, really? Do you need that? Really? Um, then it costs more because, oh, they asked us something that depended on three other migrations. So now you're at like a two calendar weeks. It's just like twelve to twenty-four thousand dollars. It's silver. Is this real? Yeah. This is real. Very oh, wait, why didn't you go live? Oh, why can't you? Can you do that on the weekend? Can you just run those migrations at night? I've worked every weekend for the last six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, then you go live. Um, so you use your go live checklist. You check your DNS and your DNS. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then you check it again after you go live and you check it again mm -hmm. the next day and you keep doing that a little bit. And I think the biggest one here is that you have to practice over and over because it's your A game. Mm -hmm. Stuff will happen and you have to relax with it and just make sure that you know that you've done everything you can. And your team is probably going to be super tired, right? So nobody's going to have to deal with the midnight, like, well, crap, something happened. But yeah, you know what? In this site, the DNS for the host failed. So upstream, vendor problem. Vendor like, problem. We couldn't have planned for that, but, well, we have a mitigation strategy. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, there is no mitigation for that. The vendor, I cannot hit the vendor sites for the source or destination at all. There is no mitigation. You're just screwed here. It, you, it turned off for four hours. And that failure was identified on one of the backups that we had asked it to run. And thank goodness, not a migration <coughs> pass. Because if you would run it on a migration pass, you'd have to roll back as you were going live. That sucks. That's hard. Everybody's like on nerve. And it will, like, will add time to your go live. So if you have had a window with your client to go live in two hours, because that's what you expected, and it's going to add six, then that's not good. Um, and the DNS, but we, our DNS propagated fine when we finally changed it. So ours was fine. This is a real story, by the way. Also, the last step is post-launch validation, and you can't underestimate this. 
right? So d is the site working? Yeah. Right. Are your redirects in place? Like, did the DNS completely propagate, or okay. was there some old TTL value that's getting in the way that oh. you maybe want to some mitigate CDN by some rerouting and fancy <laughs> fire? I really hear your artifacts are the speed tests, SEO tests, error logs, <coughs> and lots of feedback from site users. And the Nexus travel for this site, we saw the 404 log showed some missing redirects, so we added them. They were like super old that were on their, their like Apache, like, uh, yeah, and HTTP. There were redirects in their old super server, server yeah. that we didn't see when we were in Drupal. Yeah, and the vendors were happy with their new features um, and that they were like let know that the features took a little bit longer, so the client was happy. Um, and some data expected by members was like missing because that was new features by the client, like surprise their member base. So that's okay, it's the client's problem, but it's, they told us to do that. So, so the takeaways from this are that <laughs> incomplete requirements equals rework <laughs> and increased time and cost. And, and the more dev and the more testing, it's just gonna get bigger and bigger. Bigger and bigger. And your team may change over time. Your team will change over time. Um, and write everything down. Because you might pull other people on to help you with targeted migration work. So if you have everything written down, like like the last project, I'm like, hey, Ryan, can you come in and just get lend us a hand for a couple of passes? He's like, oh, cool, you have your migration mapping done. Cool, thanks. And it's like, yeah. yeah. It's much easier to start when you have everything presented to you like in one document. And you can just go, oh, I'm just going to code really yeah. quick. But normally you'd have to go, okay, how do I find out about this? And you have to look all over the place. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank you, everybody. Um, join us for contribution sprints on Friday. Um, and it, please go to the session page and um, give us a rating. And we will put all the slide deck up so you guys can have the 10 phases. And this will be video. <laughs> We're only five minutes over budget. Oh, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> what, what percentage is that? Is that five, like 5%? Five oh, so just under 10. Yeah, just under 10. Sorry, <laughs> math. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we actually set the we set the overtime budget expectation. <laughs> I did I did want to start five minutes early. <laughs> we also did that. So oh, we technically did, uh, we were like ten minutes over budget. But that's okay. It was the value. It was a value based <laughs> overage. <laughs> Yeah, you kind of still in the I, I think I need another coffee. I don't know.